Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this third session in our IoT for Beginners WIO Terminal Hackathon edition. If you joined us last week, uh, Monday last week, we looked at an introduction to the Internet of Things, talking about what it is, how it works, how you can use it, and we got going setting up an IoT device. Tuesday, we then dived into connectivity. We connected our IoT device to the cloud, and we kind of sent messages back and forth and kind of saw how everything worked. Today, we're going to look at sensors and actuators. Uh, if you were there for the session on last Monday, I mentioned that the T in IoT stands for things, and it's about devices that interact with the physical world via sensors and actuators, so to read data from the physical world and interact back with it. And that's what we're looking at today. And then tomorrow, we've got a really cool session uh, about running AI on these small IoT devices. You do not want to miss that. That one is a lot of fun. So if you weren't here last week, if you don't know who I am, my name is Jim Bennett. I'm an education cloud advocate at Microsoft, which means it's my job to help anybody involved in learning or education be successful with Microsoft products, especially things like students, faculty, educators, teachers. I'm here to help you learn about the Microsoft products, be successful with them, and empower your students to kind of learn the skills they need to be successful in their careers. I particularly focus on the Internet of Things. So any questions about IoT, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll help you where I can. I'm all over the internet at Jim Bob Bennett. So Twitter, GitHub, Instagram, LinkedIn, Jim Bob Bennett. Feel free to reach out, connect, and hit me up with any questions that you've got. Now, everything we've talked about last week and everything we're we'll focused on today is all available to you as part of a 24 lesson curriculum that we've built to help you learn all about the Internet of Things right from the basics. So the aka.ms slash IoT dash beginners, this is where you can go to get a whole lot of great content to teach you IoT. This is what you'd get when you go there. It's so it's 24 lessons and it really goes right back to the basics of what is the Internet of Things, how does it work, the different devices you might use, sensors, actuators, connectivity. And then it kicks into a lot of project focused learning to allow you to learn some of the core concepts of the Internet of Things. It starts with digital agriculture. We look at temperature measurement for, so, for plant growth prediction and soil moisture manage, measurement to build an automated watering system. We then look at uh, logistics, uh, so location tracking, storing of data, visualizing it on maps, geofences, things like that that you might use when doing any kind of GPS-based work. We then move to AI on IoT, doing manufacturing with quality assurance on fruit, running AI models in the cloud and then on the edge to verify that your fruit is of the quality you want. We then move to retail. We look at what's on the shelves, you know, using uh, AI to count stock on shelves, and then we move to consumer devices. Again, using AI with IoT to allow you to build your own smart timer device, device that you can control with your voice. And it's all there for you to use. It's all completely free. All these 24 lessons are free. It's on GitHub, it's MIT licensed. So it's there for you to learn through self-guided learning or take into the classroom and teach in your classroom. So dive into that. There's some great content there. The sessions we did last week and this week kind of cherry picked from various parts of this particular course to kind of give you some of the basic overviews. I also want to give a shout out to our friends at Seed Studios, aka.ms slash IoT dash beginners dash kits. If you go here, this will take you to a nice landing page where you can buy the hardware that you might want to use for IoT for beginners. Now with IoT, the T is things, hardware is kind of the key component to what you're building. And so to make it easier, to complete the, the 24 lessons of IT for Beginners, Seed have pre-packaged two different types of kits. You can get a kit based off a WIO terminal, the device we're using for the, uh, for last week and this week's sessions, and that's got all the sensors you need to complete 24 lessons, or you can get a kit based off a Raspberry Pi. Either way, it's kind of a one-click purchase, they've packaged up a nice box for you, so you can get all the hardware you need. Now, obviously, hardware costs money, and we want to make sure that this is accessible to everybody, including those who don't want to spend money on hardware just to get going with IoT. And so IoT for Beginners does support virtual hardware. You can do the whole thing without buying any hardware devices, just running through a little simulator application that runs locally and simulates sensors. So if you don't want to spend any money up front, you can do IoT for Beginners without any hardware. If you do want to buy hardware, see Studios, your friends. They've made it easier to buy the hardware including this device, the WIO Terminal, the one that we're looking at in today's session. So we're calling this the WIO Terminal Hackathon. Why, why is it the WIO Terminal Hackathon edition? And the reason is because at Microsoft, we host the what I believe is the world's largest corporate hackathon. 
the entire company gets together for a few days each year. Normally it's July, this year we're doing it in October for a global hackathon. And this is teams from all over Microsoft. They come together, they bring their ideas and they work on something together that could potentially have world-changing impact. And this hackathon is where Microsoft employees can kind of step outside their, their day job and try ideas they would never have done just as part of their normal nine to five. And this has actually led to some amazing products that have been released and have changed the lives of people. You may have seen adverts for our Xbox adaptive controller. When, when we all play, everybody wins. The advantage of the adaptive controller is you can play Xbox games no matter what your physical capabilities are. And that came out of a hackathon. Seeing AI, an app for visually impaired people to describe the world around them, came out of a hackathon. So it's a great way for people to take their ideas to a product that could potentially have world-changing capabilities. And as part of the hackathon, we run a series called Hackernauts. It's the idea of we want people to learn new skills, use those new skills to make an impact, and come together with other folks from different parts of Microsoft to work out how they can build their hacks. And as part of the Hackernauts program, we have been providing groups of Microsoft employees with a device called a weird terminal. This one here, Arduino device, with a load of sensors, screens, and other bits and pieces. And so we thought it'd be fun to put on some, some training for the folks at Microsoft to learn how to use these devices, click into the cloud, get data out. And rather than just limit that just to Microsoft, we thought it'd be fun to share this with you. So this is a way to show you, you know, a little bit of an insight into the kind of things we do as part of our Microsoft Global Hackathon, if you're potentially interested in coming to work for us at Microsoft, but also allow us to share some great content to show you how to get started with IoT devices like the Rio Terminal connecting it to the cloud. So let's kick off today with interacting with the physical world. And today we're gonna to talk about sensors that gather data and actuators that send feedback. And so these are the devices that turn your thing into a useful device. They allow you to interact with the physical world. IoT is kind of all about physical computing. It's about having devices that know what the world is like and can interact back with, with the physical world, connected to the internet, to cloud services, to capabilities, to do something with the data they gather and they control the feedback that the devices give. So we're going to cover kind of Two areas, sensors, I say, actuators. And we're going to look at what are sensors. We're going to use a sensor. And then we're going to dive into kind of some sensor types and learn a bit more about how they work. And then same with the actuators. We're going to quick look at what they are, actually start using one, and then we'll look at the different types and kind of how they all work together. So let's start off with the question of what are sensors? So sensors are hardware devices that sense the physical world. And they measure physical properties and send that information to an IoT device. So the sensors are electronic versions of the senses that you have in your body. You can sense touch. You touch something, you can kind of feel what you're touching. Smell, taste, sight, hearing, your sense of balance, temperature sensors, all these things that you have in your body. This is your way of detecting properties of the physical world. And the various parts of your body convert that to electrical signals that get sent to your brain for processing. Funny enough, this morning I was reading that some of the scientists who are researching how things like touch make it to the brain have just won a Nobel Prize for biology, which is very, very cool. But these do it not through, through nerves. They sense the world through electronic components and send electrical signals to an IoT device. Now, the common sensors you get, temperature and humidity, this is pretty much the, the 101 sensor. If you look at a lot of beginning IoT projects, a lot of beginning maker projects, you'll probably see things like a BME 280 temperature pressure humidity sensor or a DHT sensor, other kind of temperature sensors. These are kind of the, the ones that are everywhere. These are the kind of the core sensors. You also have things like buttons. A button is a sensor. It's sensed whether it's being pressed or not. That's a fairly, again, fairly standard sensor. You get light sensors that detect things like light levels, light colors. Let's get a lot. Kids' toys, you play with Lego Boost, for example, they have color sensors, but a colored thing in front of the, the robot and it does things. So you get sensors to measure things like that. Uh, useful for things like digital agriculture. If you have tomatoes zipping through a machine, you wanna make sure only ripe tomatoes go through, you just need a green color sensor. Green tomatoes, get knocked out. Cameras, cameras are sensors. They sense light levels around the world, but they capture it in the form of a picture. Accelerometers, how things are moving, the distance they're moving. Microphones, detect sound. All these are fairly common sensors. And actually, if you think about your mobile phone, which is really an IoT device, it'll have a lot of these sensors built in. 
Maybe not temperature and humidity, but it'll have buttons, have a light sensor that turns the screen off when you hold the phone to your ear. It'll have, it's got a camera, it's got accelerometers, it's got a microphone. So it's a whole lot of sensors built into things like a phone. But these sensors are kind of everywhere. And they all do the same thing in that they convert a physical property into an electrical signal. So let's actually use one. Let's just dive in and actually get going with the sensor. And the particular sensor I'm using is a temperature sensor, kind of a good 101 level sensor. So this is the temperature sensor here. This is a DHT11 from Seed Studios, a digital humidity and temperature sensor. So encased in this blue plastic box here is the actual sensor components. It's in, a, it's in like a blue cage to protect it. And then we have a socket here. It's a four pin Grove socket. Grove is part of the seed ecosystem to allow you to connect components together. And the shape of the socket is such, it's got two little raised areas on the side. The shape of this is so that you can only plug the cable in one way. And if you actually look at the bottom of a weird terminal, put another one here to look at, on the bottom we have the same socket, four pins, the little pushed out sections to only connect the cable one way. And this allows you to connect a cable from the device to the weird terminal. So, Here's a Grove cable. It's four color cable, yellow, white, red, and black on the wires. And then it's got the connector with two little sticky out bits, which I'm sure there's a technical name for the sticky out bits. I don't know what it is, but that way it can only go in one way. So I can push this into the socket on the temperature sensor. That just clips in. It doesn't click in here or anything like that. It's not, there's no kind of catch on there. It just slides all the way in. And that's my temperature sensor connected. And then I can do the same on the Grove board. So the actual weird terminal has got the Grove sock at the bottom, and I can just push the sensor in. And that's my sensor connected. This is one of the things I love about the Grove ecosystem from Seed, in that you just plug in cables. There's no electrical engineering, there's no breadboard and wires and resistors and things like that. I just plug it straight in, and away I go. Now, on the weird terminal, there's two Grove ports. Is, is another one, so you can see two growth ports, one each side of the USB-C socket, and they're, they're both called multifunction growth ports, but they do slightly different jobs. So the one on the right-hand side, that does both digital and analog signals, which we'll look at more of later. One on the, on the left-hand side does digital, but also I squared C, which is a way of communicating over, um, for, a way for uh, devices to communicate Put sending more data than just simple values. We're not going to dive into that now. It's all an IT for beginners if you want to learn more. So that's that plugged in to, to our device. I'm going to take a quick quick question here because it's kind of a, an interesting question. So the weird terminal here is what is a cer certified device. So uh, on the Azure IoT platform, we, we talked a little about, about the platforms last time, but on the pl various platforms, we can have certified devices that come with firmware you can deploy to kind of connect to the cloud. And one question has been asked is, are there any IoT devices other than the Raspberry Pi that are certified by the Azure IoT platform? So, well, yes. So we have what we call our plug and play certification, which is devices that you can just push some firmware to and it will just connect to IoT Central, our software as a service platform and send data. And there's a whole range of different devices, absolutely massive array of different devices from motion sensors to edge devices to IoT developer kits. There's a whole load of devices that are kind of certified as it were for the Azure IoT platform. And there's even manufacturers who make kits that have a uh, sort of an Azure um, theme behind them. So this from Espressive, conveniently happened to have under hand. This is an ESP32 Azure IoT kit. It's an Arduino kit based off the ESP32 uh, microprocessor and Wi-Fi and all that gubbins. And as you says the top here, ESP32 Azure IoT kit. It's even got a light labeled Azure that lights up. So this is designed to connect to Azure IoT. And we've you can use things like uh, FreeRTOS with the Azure middleware or Azure RTOS on devices like this. So there's a whole load of different devices. Um, yeah, a whole load that, depending on what you want, there's, there's just loads and loads of different devices. Um, and Hopefully one of the moderators will be able to just drop, a, drop you a link to show you the whole range of different devices that are certified for the Azure platform. Great question, great question. When you get something to the cloud, it's kind of that question of, is this certified, does, does this work with the cloud? It's a really good question. So that's our temperature sensor connected. Uh, now we can just write some code to use it. Now, before I write the code, actually, before I write the code, I, I neglected to mention something 
last last session. So apologies. I've had a couple of people contact me to say they've had problems connecting their Wii terminal to Wi-Fi. And the reason is the, the Wii terminal, when it's provided to you, the stock firmware is a little bit out of date. You do need to update the firmware to the latest version to allow you to connect to the cloud. So I didn't mention this because I've done it. You do it once with the device and you forget about it. And um, I forgot about it. So apologies, apologies, apologies. Uh, but if you go to the, the C Studio website, search for Wii Terminal, head to the wiki, you'll find those instructions there on how to update the firmware. So if you get any issues connecting to the Wi-Fi, it's an error about a shield not being connected, make sure you update your, your firmware. It's all available on the C Studio's website. So just search the Wii Terminal, go to the wiki, and there's instructions there on how to update your firmware. So you need to do that before you connect to, to the internet, before you connect to Wi-Fi. Okay, so this is the code we had last time, the code we used to connect and send the, the Hello World telemetry up to the cloud. And so let's start by adding a library. So this particular sensor, it's a temperature and humidity sensor, kind of does, does both at the same time. And so to make it easy to talk to the sensor, there is a library. And that library has got all the, the code in there that connects to the sensor, pulls out the data and separates out the temperature and humidity data. We could read the raw data if you wanted to, but that'll be hard. And I can't be bothered, we can just use a library. Again, another good thing about the Grove ecosystem is for any more advanced piece of hardware, they usually have a library that makes it easier to use. So back in my main.cpp, and I can bring in the header file for this. It comes from that library we just added. And then I can declare the sensor. Let's do it here. This is a DHT, Digital Humidity and Temperature Sensor. It's on pin D0. So if I go back to my camera, D0, digital pin zero, that one there. And it's a DHT11. So there's multiple types of this temperature sensor. This is a DHT11, that's the type that's there. You have to tell the library which type so that it knows how to read the data off it. And there's more advanced sensors and more accurate ones. This one is kind of a, a good price range. It's accurate enough and the price is not too expensive for a sensor. And then once, once we got there, I just need to actually begin the sensor that starts it up and tells it to start, start measuring data. And that's it. Our sensor is now ready to go and start pulling values off. The way I do that is in my loop here, I define a two value array and then I read the temperature and humidity into that two value array. It's two floats in an array, pass that to read temperature and humidity, and that puts the values in. Now, a little bit of a gotcha here, a little bit of a gotcha, which you'll see when I just, I'm just change how we define the telemetry. And the way, the way we define, the way we show the telemetry is rather than do the um, hello world as we did before, we're actually writing the humidity and temperature to the, uh, into the telemetry that gets sent to, uh, um, to Azure IoT Hub. Now, when I write the humidity, I am writing the zeroth value from my array. It's temp humval zero. When I write the temperature, I write the, fir the first value from the array, temp humval one. So the zeroth value is humidity, the, f the, the first value is temperature. So I'm reading humidity and temperature. The function is called read temp and humidity. This is a little gotcha. Although you're reading temp and humidity, you're actually reading humidity and temp, if that makes sense. It's the array has them humidity first, then temperature. But the implication of the function name is it's temperature, then humidity. So just a little gotcha, the zeroth value is the humidity. So we can read that, we put that on our telemetry, and then we can set that. And if I just now build this, I'm just gonna turn my wheel term on, and then do the magic, magic double click. I'll just show the magic double click. You push down twice very quickly on that button. That puts it into upload mode. We need to do that every time before we upload. I run the upload, this will now compile it. Take a while because it's got to compile in the new library that's been added. And that causes all the libraries to recompile. Let's give that a second, that'll compile and then that'll push that down to the device. There we go. Oh, 
uploading verify done. So we've got our temperature sensor there. We'll now connect. And there we go, 51% humidity and 24 degrees. So, uh, temperature is all in Celsius. So if you're in the US and you want to do it in Fahrenheit, you'll have to write your own conversion uh, from Celsius to, uh, to Fahrenheit. It always comes through as Fahrenheit. So it's nice and warm in my office. It's getting into to autumn here. It's a bit chilly outside. So I've got the heating on. So it's kind of nice and warm, 24 degrees. Now I'm just going to go and breathe on this and uh, we'll, we can see the levels change. So go with me one second. So just huffed on there a little bit, warm, moist air, and you see the humidity has gone up to 95% and the temperature has gone up to 26 degrees. So that's measured the change in temperature from the warm air uh, from my lungs and the humidity gone up. Um, obviously in this our time of COVID, probably not something you should be doing in a public place, um, but uh, if, when you're by yourself huffing onto it, it's probably not so bad. So humidity is up there, that would eventually come down and the temperature went up and it's dropping. If I just waft my hand over it to try and clear out the air, hopefully that humidity should eventually start to drop. Now, I guess it's got condensation inside it now. So that, that would eventually drop. So that's reading that humidity and temperature and that's now being sent up to the cloud. So if we could then do something to process this uh, if we wanted to. That's using the sensor. So we've seen the sensor in use, let's actually talk about the different sensor types. And there's two types of sensors. There's analog sensors and digital sensors. And that's pretty much how everything kind of falls into one of these two buckets, an analog sensor or a digital sensor. Now, an analog sensor produces a continuous analog signal proportional to the thing you are sensing. So everything works on electricity. You have electrical signals zipping around everywhere. And so for an analog sensor, you send electricity to something and you get some electricity back. And that analog signal the electricity you get back is based off what you're measuring. A digital sensor, on the, other, on the other hand, is one and zero, but it's either a binary sense that's only got two values or it's digital data coming back from a device. A button switch is kind of a classic digital sensor. It's on or off. Those are the only two states. You can't have a switch on kind of halfway or a button on a halfway. So it's analog sensors and digital sensors. Let's talk about analog sensors. Analog sensors essentially work by you send a voltage to the, the sensor, you get a voltage back. And the difference between the two is related to the property you are measuring. So most IT devices work at either 3.3 volts or 5 volts. And so you would send, say, 3, 5 volts from a device to a sensor. And then if you got back 2.5 volts, you know that you're reading a certain value. What that value is depends on the sensor and all that kind of thing, but that's kind of how you read it. It sends a voltage and then reads a voltage level back. So voltage is the measure of effort needed to push electricity from one point to another. It's not the amount of electricity, that's ampage, it's the amount of push from one to the other. And you often hear about your know, uh, voltage 240, 250 volts or 120 volts in your mains, and voltage sounds scary, but voltage is actually not scary. Voltage will not hurt you. It's amps that will hurt you. Voltage, I've had millions of volts go through me. There's great toys like Van de Graaff generators where you put your hand on a big steel, a big metal dome, shiny dome, and it runs a plastic belt round around in circles and generates millions of volts of electricity and your hair stands on end, if you have hair, which I don't. Uh, my daughter, she's eight, she's got curly red hair and she generates probably millions of volts by jumping on a trampoline, all of her hair sticks up but it's millions of volts at such a tiny level of ampage, you don't feel it. You might get a little electric shock. You know, she comes off the trampoline and hugs me and I get a shock. That's, that's the voltage, but the ampage is low. A small number of volts with a high number of amps will hurt you. Voltage doesn't hurt you if it's not combined with amps. So it's the amount of push. So we push five volts there, and then the, number of, the amount of push that comes back the other side is what we measure. So one example is a potentiometer. It's kind of like a, a classic example of an analog sensor. So let me just show you one. This is a potentiometer here. This is a Grove one, it's got the Grove socket and it's got uh, a black knob on here that I can rotate. And I can go from one position and I can rotate it. Not all the way around, it's maybe three quarters of the way around. I can rotate this thing to different levels. So that's a potentiometer. If you've got like a volume control on a stereo system, but you can turn the knob from one, to one 
uh, it doesn't com completely spin, it just goes from one you know, zero to 11, uh, for example, then you can, you know, that's kind of a potentiometer. And so the idea is, as depending on where you turn it to, that's how many volts come back. So if you zero, so you send five volts to it, one into the dial, you get zero volts back, one in the dial, you get five volts back, you put it in the middle, get two and a half volts, and you can work out where it is based off the amount of voltage coming back. It's kind of proportional. So if you had a scale of one to 10, you know, if you've got half a volt is one, one volt be two, one and a half volts is three, and so on and so on and so on. So the voltage comes in and you get some voltage coming back. Now, voltage, as I said, it's an analog signal and computers are digital. We always think about computers, digital devices. Yeah, I said digital sensors are ones and zeros. Computers work in ones and zeros. So how do we deal with that analog signal? How do we deal with that voltage? And you do it with what's called an ADC, an analog to digital converter. And these digitize analog values so that the IoT device can use them. So the analog input goes in, the ADC digitizes it, and then you get the signal out. Now, a lot of IT devices have an inbuilt ADC. So if you just connect stuff to the pins on them, they will then better convert the analog value to digital value. Or a sensor can actually have an ADC on board. So it acts like a digital sensor, because when you connect it, there's an ADC on board that converts the analog value to a digital value that you then read. Now, the way this is traditionally done is using a 10-bit value. So it's, all, it's always 10 bits. I have no idea why it's 10 bits. I'm sure there's a good reason. I don't know what that is. But it's always a 10-bit value, which means when you read an analog value, you get from 0 to 1,023. Now, you kind of don't really care what that maps to in terms of a voltage. You care the fact it's 0 to 1,023. And then what that means in terms of a value depends on the sensor. Sometimes it's just this is the value coming back, and you have to find a calibration yourself. It doesn't map to a known unit. Other times it does map to a known unit. You know, it could be there's a light level, that there's an equation you can run on the light level to convert that to an actual measure of lumens. Or it could just be it's a capacitance measure you know, and you calibrate yourself. So there's a lot of libraries that can handle all this for you. So you get like a sensor that reads temperature and it's all done via an analog signal. And you're, you call the library, you get back an app uh, the temperature value in Celsius, uh, but internally the software handles that for you. Others it doesn't. So what another example would be this one here. This is a capacitive soil moisture sensor. So it's a long blue bar with a little pointy bit on the end to, to go in soil. There's a white line on here for the soil level. Push that into soil, connect the cable to the growth connector, and this will measure the capacitance of the soil. And you can use this to measure moisture levels. And you, this is an analog sensor. You get a value from zero to 1,023, and that tells you how moist the soil is in moistness. There isn't, there isn't a value, there isn't a unit. It's not like 643 means so many whatevers. It kind of varies. So you would then use this with your own kind of calibration to work out how moist you want the soil to be. So you can actually do experiments to convert, the, you know, to dry the soil out, measure the moisture level, moisture level, and use that to calibrate your sensor yourself, and then work out what number makes sense for your soil. You know, with five, 500 and above is what you need for your soil, or what have you. You would then calibrate that yourself. So that's analog sensors. Let's move to digital sensors and start with the basic ones, which are just simple on-off sensors. So switch button, that's kind of the classic one. I've got a little button here. Again, a bit of Grove kit, Grove sensor, and just a little button, a little tiny black button on there, and a print of the microphone. Don't know if you can hear that. It kind of clicks as I press it. When I hold it down, it's on. When I let go, it's off. So hold it down, on, let go, off. When I hold it down, it's one, let go, zero. So I'll send voltage to it. I'll get back zero volts when it's off. When I press it, I send voltage and I get the same voltage back. And that's that's the basics of a simple digital sensor. Now, in terms of the onness, offness, you always lose a little bit of voltage. There's always going to be a little drop through things like resistance. The energy gets converted to, to a little bit of heat or what have you. And so you can't say it's got to be exactly the same voltage. Normally, you have a threshold. So you would pick maybe like a halfway point. And if it's above the halfway point, it's on. If it's below that, it's off. And that makes it more accurate. If you're doing, if you put five volts in and get 4.5 volts back, you're on. Five volts in, 0.1 volts back, you're off. Now, think about analog sensor. If you are out by half a volt, that could make a big difference. 
that could be one uh, one tenth of your vo of your volume level. You've got a, a scale from zero to ten. Put in five volts, get back four point five volts. That's that's a, that's a value of nine. But that could be you've lost some electricity through resistance or or what have you. So digital allows you to be a bit more accurate and it kind of has that tolerance level. If it's kind of above the halfway point, it's on. Otherwise, it's off. Now you get more advanced digital sensors where they have an ADC built on board to get back digital data. And that's what our DHT sensor is. This is a digital humidity and temperature sensor. So inside here is the hardware to convert the electrical reading for humidity and temperature into a digital signal that comes down the cable and we read that digital signal. And that contains not just one value, it's got two values, the humidity and temperature. And so we can read both by using the built-in ADC. Now, digital sensors can get really, really advanced. You're sending digital data, you're communicating with an IoT device using digital values. And so you can send anything that you could use that's a digital value. You think computers talk digital data all the time. We send digital data over Wi-Fi, over cables, USB cables, anything. So you can send more advanced data. You can, you know, the digital temperature humidity sensor, one example, two values come through, but there's so much more you can send. Um, things like cameras. A camera sensor is a digital sensor. It uses a lens to focus light on a number of different image sen uh, light sensors that measure light levels in red, green, and blue, or other ways. And it takes all the data from all these pixels. It's a kind of a raw set of image data. It will usually then compress that into a known image format like JPEG or GIF or PNG, and it will convert that on the board using hardware on the board and then the digital signal you get back has just got the compressed picture. You just, you, know, you make a call to the device and it gives you back the JPEG. And so that's kind of quite an advanced digital sensor. It's kind of just treating it almost like a, a device in its own right. Almost like a, your computer sending an image over Wi-Fi, something like that. So they're a lot more advanced. So you can get really, really advanced sensors coming out of this. I mean, just a kind of a few examples of other sensors. You know, you can do things like, Multi-segment displays, if you want to have like a clock kicking down, this is one with four digits, four digit multi-segment display. Uh, oh, this is a fun one, GPS. So this is a GPS sensor. It's got an aerial, big square aerial connected by a cable, chip on board to process that. This, it's all Grove sensors, all easy to use to plug it in. Uh, but the GPS sensor, that will send additional data using what's called NMEA sentences. So this will communicate with multiple satellites and then send messages over essentially a serial cable, the same as we did re reading serial data from our WIA terminal. The GPS device will send the same, same kind of data, uh, will send data the same way, sorry, over a thing called UART, which is just a way of communicating data over a serial cable. And it will send information like she's received a signal from a satellite, it's this satellite, uh, this is where the satellite is in the sky. This is registration. Uh, it's worked out positions. So it's position updates and all this kind of stuff that's really detailed data that you would then un pass through to actually get your GPS position and other kind of location data. It's kind of, there's you know, you can get quite powerful. Ah, come back. Quite powerful uh, digital sensors going on that send a lot of good data. Okay, so that's sensors, we've talked about sensors. Let's now talk about actuators. And you can think of actuators as the opposite of sensors. So a sensor gathers real world data, an actuator takes action in the real world. So a sensor takes real world property, converts to electrical signal that your IoT device processes. The IoT device can send electrical signal to an actuator, which takes an interaction with the physical world. So it's pretty much the opposite of a sensor. Instead of, let, instead of physical property goes to electrical signal, it's electrical signal goes to physical property. So some examples, an LED, put electricity in, it lights up. You can get a light sensor that does light to electricity, LED does electricity to light. Speaker, put in electricity, a magnet wobbles, wobbles a, a cone, produces noise. The, Inverse of that is a microphone. A microphone, you, you wobble the cone, it wobbles a, a magnet, it produces electrical signal. Relay, this electrical switch. Rather than you turn the switch on, the signal's detected. This time, instead, the signal turns the switch on. Screen, opposite of a camera. 
instead of capturing light levels at different pixels, it displays light levels at different pixels. Motors. Yeah, a motor, put, it, put in electricity and it spins. You can also use that for a sensor. If you spin a motor yourself, it generates electricity. That's what a generator is. When we have power stations that generate power, they spin a, basically they spin a motor to produce electricity. So you can use that to measure speed or you can put electricity in to produce motion and you have a motor. So it's kind of this lovely symbiotic relationship between sensors and actuators. Symbiotic? Probably not, probably not, not the right word, but it's a lovely relationship that sensors and actuators kind of equal and opposite. The actuators do different opposite things from the sensors. So this allows you to interact back with the physical world. Read the temperature, not hot enough, generate heat. Read humidity levels, not, not, not wet enough, do something to, to spray, spray water. We read soil moisture levels, not wet enough, turn on a pump, things like that. Uh, GPS, read your location, not in the right place, fly your drone somewhere, all these kind of things. So actuators allow you to interact back with the physical world. So let's use one. Before we dive in too deep, let's actually use one. Let's connect an LED to our temperature sensor. So I've got an LED here. Here is my LED. This again is a Grove sensor, all about the Grove kit here. I have a green LED connected here. And there's this, there's an orange dial here. This is a variable resistor that I can turn to adjust the brightness of the LED. So if I can actually use this to limit how much energy gets pushed the LED and I can turn, it, turn the brightness down if it's too bright. Now, one thing about LEDs is an LED is a light emitting diode. And a diode is an electrical device that can only accept electricity one way. So you can get electricity zipping back and forward through things. And rather than just a diode, only lets electricity go one way. You hear about the alternating current, which has electricity going back and forward. And the diode says, nope, only send it one way. It won't go back the other way. An LED is one of those, a light emitting diode. But what that means really for someone like me who doesn't care too much about how electricity works, is you have to plug it in the right way. So this LED actually comes out, it's on two little legs, and when you plug it in, you may not be able to see this little teeny tiny, we've got plus and minus written by it. So on the socket the LED connects to, it's plus and minus. You have to plug the LED in the right way or it won't work. Now, usually LEDs will have a flat surface. They're kind of circular in shape, but they have a little flat surface kind of like a really overinflated letter D. And they'll have a little flat surface and that flat surface goes on the negative side. If you actually look at the board, you will see it's kind of got the flat surface uh, drawn there. So the flat surface goes on the negative side. Other times you have pins of different lengths. So you need to check how your LED indicates the negative side, positive side, and put it in the right way around or it